celebrate a living God. What a praise it is and what a joy it is to serve Him. We uh, have a lot going on, but we have a we have a missions program that we support missionaries around the world. The light is on. We're up to date on our giving, our faith promise, all of those things, and we rejoice in that. <clears throat> Sometimes I think that we forget about the commitment of our missionaries and what it really takes and just how engaged they really are. Uh, Richard and Oksana Mare are missionaries to the Ukraine And uh, I want to read just the first couple of paragraphs of his letter this time. It says, As I write in Odessa, Ukraine, on October the 10th, 2022, this is one of the most intense days of this war. For five hours, air raid sirens have been going off, and over 83 missiles and drones have been fired into the Ukraine today. Uh, Russia's blaming the Ukraine for the Crimean Peninsula Bridge. Thanking the Lord for his protection, the skill and bravery of the Ukrainian army and their defense systems, which have shot down over half of the missiles and drones. We witnessed two drones being shot down over our neighborhood in recent attacks. The Lord willing, October the 18th, we will be returning to North Poland to reach and train two churches in evangelism in preparation for a big evangelistic concert for refugees on October the 30th. The war has taken many turns over the past seven months, forcing many to make definitive, a definitive choice of what to do or where to go. Originally, over 14 million people were forced from their homes. 5.9 million fled the country as refugees. Many of those who have moved back to their homes again including over a million refugees who have returned from Europe. I read that because <clears throat> these are missionaries that God has called to the Ukraine. They've gone faithfully. They were out of there to help refugees in neighboring countries. But even with the war going on, they go back into their neighborhood. And uh, missiles flying overhead and uh, people being killed and still working evangelism campaigns and things to reach the lost. And I think we take for granted what it costs many of our missionaries and the faith that it takes to walk back into those areas and to be a part and to care about those people, love them so much that that's where God has called them so they trust that that's where they need to be. We need to pray for them, all of our missionaries, but pray for them and others that are definitely in harm's way. Um, They have taken the call of God seriously. Today I want to look at stewardship, Jesus style. We and the world around us often have one mindset for what stewardship really is. And doubtless we have all struggled with the righteous, God-honoring use of everything that God has given us. Many times, even admitting that all that we have actually belongs to God feels off. We say, but wait a minute, you know, I have worked so hard for what I have and who I am, who I have become. But everything that we have, everything that we are, is by the grace of God. Creator and sustainer of life, the giver of all the gifts, the giver of our supply, our strength, all of those things. In Luke 16, beginning in verse 1, it says, And he said unto his disciples, this is Jesus, There was a certain rich man which had a steward. The same was accused unto him, that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Father, as we come before you today, we pray for your, Lord, your power to pull us, our minds, our hearts, our understanding to just who you are and 
what it means to be a steward of everything that you've given us. Help us, Lord, to commit by faith to live for you, to give for you of all that we are and have. Show us your way today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Stewards. Well, I'm going to look at this first. There's a little poster like that I found, John Taft, and I don't know who that is, but the best way to make it through a crisis is to stop focusing on your own problems and start helping others with theirs. Put it into perspective. A steward manages. A steward doesn't own, a steward manages. And they manage things that were entrusted to them by the owner. We need to understand that as well. Okay? Because we are called to be stewards. We don't own any of it. <clears throat> and we think about stewardship, we often think about just physical property, things like that. But in truth, everything that we are and everything that we have is given to us by the grace of God. First thing I think about is our body. Our health, our eyes, our speech, our hands, with all of their strengths and abilities, we wouldn't have those except God allows us to and empowers us to have them. And so serving the Lord with all, with everything that we are, godly living, speaking life and hope, using your physical abilities, at least in part for the Lord's work, Right? Whether you're volunteering at the church or you're ministering to others beyond the church's ministries, it doesn't matter. God has given us, I mean, the scripture even talks about beautiful are the feet to carry the gospel, right? <clears throat> God has given us physical abilities, a physical body, physical health, physical, all of these things. And are we actually, as a steward of the Lord, using it for God? This is not to say that you can't do anything else but ministry. But what it is saying is everything that he gives us, we need to use for his glory, no matter what we're doing, where we're at. Our spirit, with all its eternal potential. You know, in 1 Corinthians 6.20, it says, we are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God with, <clears throat> excuse me, God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. <clears throat> he says, look, God not only created you, God not only keeps this world and everything around you going and you going so that you can exist, but he also bought back your spirit that was dead because of Adam's sin. You inherited that and all of your own sin. And he says he even bought you back from that. So in that essence, he is doubly owner of who we are if you are a Christian. He not only made you, he not only sustains you, he bought you back from sin. So your spiritual gifts the guiding presence of the Holy Spirit in your life? Are you using those to benefit others? Are you using those to bring glory to God? Are you using them in the ministries of the church? Are you using them in the place you go to work? Are you using them in trying to reach the lost? All of those things. Many times we have all these abilities that God has given us, your spiritual gifts and so on, <clears throat> and we recognize that He did but we don't recognize that it is those very gifts that are making us able to accomplish the things in the world that we can. Are we using it for His glory? Our mind, our memory, our intellect, our understanding, all of these things, our reasoning, our will to choose. Are we dedicating ourselves to the Word of God to purify that mind, to empower us, and to keep us close to God? And are we sharing it with others in order to help others, not condemn them? We move on to possessions, our wealth, our home, our cars, our opportunities, and 
you know, the benefits and blessings that they can be. Are they being used properly? You know, these all, a lot of times we talk about stewardship, people just think money. Money is important, okay? We, that's the way everything runs in this world, right? But that's not all of it. That's a small part of who we are to be to the world and to our God and as a part of his church. Supporting the local church, giving through the local assembly. That's found in the scripture. It was given to man before the law was even given in Abraham. It's taught by Jesus. We have been given the blessings and the responsibilities of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What are we doing with it? I hope you've received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's the first thing that it's supposed to do is lead you to Him, right? That's what gives you everlasting life. That's what gives you the Holy Ghost in your life. That's what gives you the understanding of the Scripture and all of those things that you need to be a part of. Uh, of learning and need to become a part of the essence of who you are. What about the grace and the mercy and the love of God that He's bestowed upon you and passed on to you? Are you using it for His glory? Are you passing it on to someone else? The worship of God. What an awesome privilege. Are we using it? Are we worshiping? Are we engaged in it? The Bible. I mean, we have the Bible, we have Bibles laying around all over. We have them on our phones. We have them all you know, kinds of places. And I have not looked it up recently, but there was uh, a number of something like 4,000 languages on this earth that still do not have the Bible in their own language. Are we using the blessing of having the Bible in our own language? Passing that on to others? God has many conditional promises based on how we serve Him. And yet, in James chapter number 1, it says, every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of light, whom there's no variableness. He says, look, every good thing you or anyone else has ever experienced because God sent it your way. Are we using all of these for His glory? All of these things and everything else you can think of belong to God. And they are given to you and I to be stewards over. If God created us, He owns us. If God bought us back from our sin, He owns us again, right? He Everything that we are. But are we using them as good stewards, the caretakers, the overseers, of everything that God has given us. And you say, well, God hasn't given me very much. God has given you everything that you need. And if you have breath in your lungs, use it for Him. If you have finances, use it for Him. If you have intellect, use it for Him. Whatever it is that you have, use it for Him. Now, we need to understand this. This is not something God has to have. In, in the 50th Psalm, he says, for every beast of the forest is mine. God does. And the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. He says, in essence, you don't have anything that I need to exist. So it's not about that. But you are a part of what I own, God says. We come back to this lesson about the steward. The accusation leveled against this steward. Now, the accusation was made to the owner 
And so he called the guy in on it. Now, I don't know if you understand it, but the devil stands before the Lord and accuses the brethren, that's you and I, of all kinds of things. Now, God knows everything anyway, but we are being accused. Here's a man standing accused, and the accusation, I want you to notice this, the accusation about this man who was the steward of somebody else's property was, you have wasted the opportunity. He didn't say you embezzled all of my money. He said I was put into your charge so that you could earn something from it. Remember the the talents, the parable of the talents. Three different people were given varying amounts and one of them said, I'm just going to bury it because I'm afraid I'll make a mistake and I'll lose it and, and you'll hate me for it. And when, it, when the, uh, the owner came back, he says, what'd you get me? And they all gave return except the one. And he said, you know, why didn't you at least try to get some interest on it? You know? And so what did he do? He took away from the one and he gave it to the others that were using the things to make a better improvement, gain for the owner. We have been given so much, and we have been given the mission of reaching the world with it, and is he going to say to us, look, I gave you all of this, and you're wasting it. I'm going to take it away from you. And that can be anything. That can be a spiritual gift. That can be health, wealth. It can be anything in your life. God is God, and whatever he does is right. He's given us so much, and he says, look, what gain is there for wasting what you've been given? None. There's no gain for you because there's no reward to be given. There's no uh, encouragement from the owner, God, in your life. But what about all of those people that you have been given all of these gifts to reach? The Christians around you that need encouragement, the lost world that needs to know Jesus. What is the cost of that? You're not going to lose your salvation because he promised us if we accept him, he's going to give us everlasting life, not everlasting life until our next sin. Okay? So we're not going to lose our salvation But what about our purpose, the rewards in heaven? But all of these people, there are so many people on this world today that do not know Jesus. And we have been gifted with so much to do that. You know, we have access almost instantly to people all around the world. And what do we use it for? To show them what we're eating? Show them a funny pet. Is that actually wasting? There will be an accounting. You will be called before the owner, God, the judge. And if everything is in order, there's no reason to fear an audit, right? Right? If you've been using everything that you are and have for the glory of God, and I'm not talking about exclusivity that you don't do anything in the world, you don't do anything. I mean, we need to go out and work. We need to rub shoulders with the world. We need to work side by side with them. There's a lot of things that we need to do in this world. So I'm talking about using it wisely in everywhere that God puts you. Okay. But the unjust steward in this... um, lesson, knows he's in trouble. Whether he knew it while he was doing it, it doesn't matter. When he was called before the owner and the owner said, look, I'm going to hold you to account. You've been wasting what I have. Immediately he knew, that's right. I haven't been doing what I was you know, hired to do, what I was given to do. And so he says, what am I going to do? None of the things that I've been living on actually belong to me. What's going to happen when the owner kicks me out? 
And he said he would. So what's he do? He begins to make alliances with the wicked. He begins to make a deal with the devil, if you will. The debts that were owed to the owner that were controlled by the steward were not the steward. They were the owners. He deserved what he was promised. Now, if he goes to an honorable man who says, hey, I'll make a deal and you don't have to pay it, and the man knows that, hey, I owe this to him, an honorable man would say, no, I need to pay my debt. So who's he making a deal with? All these people that are willing to cheat the person that stuck their neck out for them. What do we find? He says, I'm willing to cheat. I am willing to steal. And what happens? The accusation was, here you are and you have wasted what I have. Now, there is a progression of digression where he's saying, not only have I wasted, but I am willing to steal to make a deal. You see what happens when we follow wickedness in our lives instead of righteousness? It takes us step by step deeper into sin. Jesus commended the steward for this. Not for his righteousness, but for his planning. He says, okay, you're a wicked man. You're not my child anyway. But he says, you're going to get nothing from your former employer, so you better make some plans elsewhere. And that's what he was doing. He went out and said, hey, you know, you owe 500, pay 100, and I'll write off the rest. But you take care of me when I'm Kicked out of my job. I mean, it sounds like the way most things work in our world today, right? Doesn't make it right. There's a right way and a wrong way to be a steward. The maxim here that is being taught is faithfulness is a character issue. You're not really going to be faithful here and unfaithful here. You're only faithful here because there's a benefit in it, a profit in it, and a fear over it. But over here, if you're willing to be unfaithful, in truth, you're not really a faithful person. In verse 10, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. This is Jesus teaching. Okay? He that is faithful in that which is least is all is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, things that aren't actually of God, he says, who will commit your trust to your trust, true riches? He says, here is God saying, look, if you can't be faithful with some money and with some other things that are given to you and your responsibility, how can God give you great things? Things that really matter. Things that really make a difference. Notice that the steward who was accused had no problem canceling those debts that were not debts he was carrying for personal gain. The accusation never said he was taken away. He was just not doing what he was supposed to do. When he recognized that, he didn't say, I'll do better, I'll go back, work harder at it, I'll fix this, or walk away if he got fired. Instead, he takes it to the next level of wickedness, the next level of wickedness, on and on. That's the trend, that's what happened. Question, why would God entrust greater things to you if you are unfaithful with the little things? I think that should ring in our hearts. There are things that are very, very significant in our lives that God has given you stewardship over. Besides your own life, there are people you're to witness to. There are children and grandchildren in your life. There are those that you are to be influencing for Christ. There are your Christian family around you in the church that need encouragement. 
and a whole world that needs Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul wrote, For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. He says, look at the way we have ministered to you and what we've required of you. And there are people that only want to put on a show, but he says, you know the sacrifices we made. You can glory in that, that that's the way God wants things done. Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters in verse 13. You can't do it. You're going to adhere to the one and turn against the other, whatever it is, you just can't do it. It's the same, it's like a subcategory of the same maxim. Faithfulness is a character issue. If you're not faithful, you're not faithful. If you're faithful, you're faithful. It's, It's not, you can't have it both ways. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge, if one died for all, then we're all dead. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He says, look, you claim to be a child of God. You claim to be led by the Holy Spirit, but you act like everybody else out in the world. It doesn't work that way. If you're going to be effective, if you are a good steward, then you have to not just talk the talk, but walk the walk, as they say, right? You have to prove it in your daily life. You have to prove to those people that hate you that you can still love them. You have to prove to people that even though there's a debt hanging over your head, you still are willing to give to God because that's the right thing and you trust God to take care of you. Whatever area of life it is, it belongs to Him. And that's who we're supposed to be. But we come up with a thousand excuses. And in our own mind, we say, oh, I'm a good Christian because I showed up at church, I threw something in the offering plate, or I did this, or I did that. And there's, there are millions of used-to-be Christians. You all know them. Oh, yeah, I used to go to church. Yeah, I used to be a teacher. I used to run a bus. I used to whatever. What are you doing today? Now, maybe you physically, mentally, whatever, can't do it anymore. Okay. God knows those things. But did you just walk away? Because now, hey, it's somebody else's turn. That's not good stewardship. We owe it to God. It comes down to the question, who are you trying to please? Are you trying to please yourself? Are you trying to please God? Are you trying to please men? What's the most important thing to you? Your own pleasure? Your own you know, security? Whatever? Or is it God and what He wants in your life? Or is it the way other people look at you and talk about you? Proverbs 20, Solomon wrote, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find not about us. It's about Him. We can all talk about how good we are, how many good things we've done, how honest, how truthful, how upright, how whatever it is that we want to be known for. But God looks at us and says, I know what I've really given you. You know, there's an instance where uh, two people Ananias and Sapphira came before the, the uh, apostles, the deacons of the church and that, and said, you know, we're going to give everything. We sold a piece of land and we're going to give everything to the church. Everybody heard it. Everybody knows it. Okay, man, you are awesome. You know, but when Ananias comes, he says, I've given all. I've given it all. <laughs> the Holy Spirit knew they hadn't. Struck him dead. His wife comes in, says, oh, yeah, we gave it all. Everything's there. Holy Spirit said, no, you didn't. 
You may be able to lie to them, but you can't lie to me. Struck her dead. We don't realize God takes our stewardship. God takes our vows. God takes all of these things very, very seriously. And he has created and gifted each and every one of you who are believers today for a very specific purpose of reaching specific people, of making certain things glorious unto him. Of You know, you can reach people that other people can't reach at all. We're just talking about our missionaries there in Ukraine. What chance do you and I have of reaching very many of those people and proving that we really love them? These missionaries walk in there with missiles flying overhead saying, we love you, what can we do to help? There's a big difference, right? And when he's talking about this steward, he says, look, I have given you everything to care for, and you just sit back with your feet up on the desk saying, hey, what a great life I have, instead of getting up, rolling up your sleeves, and saying, what can I do to make this glorious my God. Jesus will be our judge. He is righteous and he knows everything. You will not be able to fool him. Not an attitude you had or anything you've done. However, Jesus is also our advocate. He is the one on our side. Okay? He is the one who said, I love you so much, I will come and take on flesh and live a perfect life and give my life, in fact, let them pour all of the blood out of my body and give my life so that you can have your sins paid for and have everlasting life. Now, it doesn't get any better than that kind of an advocate, right? He not only loves you a little bit, he loves you all in, and he is there for you, and he says, I'll never leave you, never forsake you. What an awesome thing. And we're going to take everything that he gave us and just waste it? Or worse, use it for evil? Come on. Makes no sense. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He doesn't say because I'm the most powerful being in the universe. He says, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your soul. Release from your worries and your fears. Peace that passeth understanding regardless of the situation. Calm assurance that the promises he has made, he will fulfill. And whatever the few moments we spend on this earth, we have a glorious forever awaiting us in heaven. Trust the Lord for your life and your provision. Trust and obey his commandments. That's what a good steward's supposed to do. Where else can we get the kind of blessings we get from the Lord? Jesus asked his disciples that in chapter 6 of John. He says, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him, with Jesus. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. We believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. And you look at the lives those men lived, and because of that faith, they went all the way through whatever it was that God had set before them, all that man and the devil could throw at them. And they went on boldly to do what God had called them to do, giving their all. In verse 2, Jesus said, Give an account of thy stewardship. Give an account. 
if you were to stand before the Lord at this moment and give an account of how you have used your body and your mind and your spirit and your possessions and all the gifts that he has given you and all of the time that he has given you in life. Would you hear him say, well done? Or would he shake his head and say, you have wasted so much. And we're not going to lose our salvation over it. I mentioned that. But this is the same one who left heaven's glory to save us from ourselves and give us life. If you've never received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior right now, you need to be reaching out, saying, how can I know? How can I do this? It is the most important decision of every single human being's life. When we sing here, you might want to step out and come. We'll share with you. <clears throat> if you're here as a believer today, you already have the Holy Spirit. You're the one that's going to be held accountable because you're the one that's a steward of the things that God owns. Are you ready for that accounting? We're sinners saved by grace. I know that. We're weak and fallen and fallible and come up short. But are we even trying? Are we even committing ourselves to it? That's the question. Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, we pray that you would be lifted up and glorified.